Hello, my name is Mark Gibson, and you're listening to the podcast version of the Chagask Signpost series, a weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. Good morning, and welcome to this morning's Signpost webinar, which is brought to you in collaboration with Dairy Sustainability Ireland, Food Drink Ireland Skillnet, and the National Rural Network. I'm delighted to be joined this morning by Professor Frank O'Mara, Director of Chagask, to outline the work that has been done on measuring sustainability on the signpost farms and in the National Farm Survey, and to outline the progress towards developing a digital sustainable uh, framework for the use with all farmers. Frank, over to you. Thank you, Pat, and good morning, everybody. I'm delighted to be here this morning at this webinar to mark the provision of sustainability reports to the farmers in the signpost programme. This was always seen as a key element of the signpost programme. The basic premise of any demonstration farm programme is that you use exemplar farmers to demonstrate best practice to other farmers. But to do this, you must have information on those farms, their performance and their progress. So for the signpost programme, we were really lucky that we had a ready-made system for measuring sustainability performance on farms that we had been using in the National Farm Survey for many years. And we decided to use this methodology with the farmers in the signpost programme. And with funding from our partners, we were able to hire additional recorders for the National Farm Survey to make this possible. The key development here is that now we have individual farmer sustainability reports for the signpost farms. While we had those type of reports and information on the farms in the National Farm Survey for many years, we weren't able to talk about those individual farms to other farmers because they're all anonymised. So now we have that for the signpost uh, farmers, and that's a very powerful knowledge transfer tool that we can use as part of the programme from here on. This is a major advance. I think it's very important that farmers know where they stand. And so that's where we're at now with the, the, the sustainability reports. The, the farmers in the signpost programme, they know what their current emissions are, what their baseline are, and they can track their progress over time in relation to that. And we think it's very important that all farmers that want it are actually in a position to do the same thing. So we are building a digital tool with ICBF and Borbia that will allow any farmer who wishes to see what their own sustainability performance is. So, for instance, what are their emissions of greenhouse gases and also how much carbon are they sequestering on their farm? And we think that's going to be a major advance in terms of working with farmers and allowing us then, with our advisory service, to develop plans with those farmers to reduce those emissions or enhance that sequestration. Back to this morning's uh, reports and what we're presenting here, it is important to realise that the first sustainability reports that farmers are getting are just a baseline. And what will be really important is how those metrics in the sustainability reports uh, evolve over time and hopefully improve over time. That's the journey that we're on with the farmers in the signpost programme. I think what is very heartening, though, um, is when we look at the metrics in, the, in these sustainability reports and compare them with the National Farm Survey sustainability report, which we launched just last Monday. And that report gives us a, natu- a national picture. And it does show that there's a very encouraging trend for the adoption of key technologies across all the farms in Ireland. So things like protected urea, low emission slurry spreading, the use of lime. But what's even more heartening is to see that our signpost farmers, as a group, they're well ahead of the average farmer in the National Farm Survey. So obviously we're working with a a group of very forward-thinking farmers in the signpost programme who want to take action on their farms to address climate change. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing the rest of the reports throughout the webinar, and I'll hand you back now to Pat. Cahill Buckley coming to us from Galway uh, to give us some background into the Chagas National Farm Survey Sustainability Report and how the team are leveraging that system to provide information on the signpost farms on an individual and a group basis. Cahill. I want to outline how we've been tracking sustainability to the Chagas National Farm Survey basically for the last decade. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, colleagues Trevor Donnellan and Brian Moran who are heavily involved in this work also. Um, by way of an overview, like I'm going to go through uh, how conceptually we, we, we think about sustainability, the data we collect in the National Farm Survey, the indicators, how we developed indicators, and then how we uh, link in with the signpost program. Okay, so um, conceptually, you know, it's, it's well established that sustainability has three main dimensions, an economic dimension, 
an environmental dimension and a social dimension, much like a three-legged stool. We also include an innovation di dimension. So, you know, the innovation um, helps to buttress the other three legs of the stool to, to make it a strong and stable system. If there's failure of one leg of one dimension or one leg of the stool, essentially you have a, you have a, a risk of, of a unsustainable farm system. So conceptually, we think of sustainable, sustainable agriculture as nested between those four dimensions. In terms of the data we collect through the National Farm Survey, well, it, it is a long history uh, going back to 1972 when we didn't, when we, we actually joined the then EEC. We were required to report on farm incomes uh, by law under accession treaty. Uh, and, and since then, we've been part of what's called the EU Farm Accountancy Data Network. So Chagas National Farm Survey fulfills this, this requirement to provide these, um, these economic data to the European Commission year on year. So it started out as an economic survey uh, we were obliged to conduct. Chagas, we're lucky that Chagas was a collection agency because we go well beyond what, what's required by, uh, by the Commission in, in the FAD network and we collect a range of other um, data that's useful to answer a number of range of policy questions. And through this framework, we started to develop our environmental metrics in, in recent times. Uh, as the director has said, the data is collected by a very professional team of dedicated farm recorders. They visit the farm to treat, visit each farm two to three times per year. Everything is, 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 cross, is, is cross validated and verified. Um, now, there is a proposal under the EU Farm to Fork strategy to transition from the EU Fadden Farm Counties Data Network to a, a farm sustainability network to look at wider wider issues than economics. So we're a little bit we're ahead of the game here in terms of we've we've gone this direction uh, before this proposal was was, was ever muted. Um, in terms of the sample size, we generally it, the NFS reports it collects data on generally between 850 and 900 farms, and the regular report it, you know splits into six systems: specialist steering, cattle rearing, which is tillage, um, soccer based cattle loader, specialist sheep, specialist tillage, and mixed livestock. We 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 amalgamate those into four for our, for our reporting purposes. As the director has said, we we launched the most recent report last Monday. Uh, it, we kind of published a comprehensive range of results. We started a journey in, in 2013. Uh, last Monday was the seventh iteration of the report. Uh, we, we, we report by main farm system, land-based farm system, dairy, capital, sheep and tillage. We report across the four sustainability dimensions, economic, environmental, social, innovation. And the most recent year, uh, we, we published uh, in, in the order of 129 indicators for 2021. Um, we also go back in time. Uh, in terms of, you know, we go back six years in the report uh, and we do rolling three-year averages in case, that, you know, there's a positive or negative price shock in any given year so we can see a long-term trend. So it's really the temporal, the temporal trends where you see the interesting uh, developments. And uh, the, the web link there at the bottom, the bottom, bottom right of the page is where the seven reports uh, are, are, can be found. The most recent report is up there now, including the, the, webin the webinar, um, if anyone who, who wants to look at it and missed it last Monday. Okay, so starting with the economic leg of the stool, um, we report we, are, we report on six indicators. So you know, economic returns to land in terms of gross output, gross margin, family farm income per hectare and per unpaid labour unit, and uh, market orientation in terms of percentage of, of the of the revenue drive from the market versus subsidies and economic viability in terms of you know can the can the farm return the minimum wage plus a five percent return on, on non land based assets. So there are the six like we report through time. Um, look, we, we we slice and dice the data in a range of different ways. So we report by by farm system, um, within farm system. So the, the the average can hide a lot. So that second graphic there is kind of a, a distribution of dairy farm incomes per hectare, family farm income per hectare. So you can see, you know, there, there's a huge distribution in terms of, of results. We also, as I say, publish by three year rolling averages. Uh, so you know, if there's any a negative or positive price or weather shock. That this is kind of smoothed out in, in, in so you're trying to isolate long-term trends in the, in the data uh, moving on to the social leg of the stool um we've three indicators in in household household structures in terms of household vulnerability where the um farmer has a risk of isolation and there's a high age profile of a farm uh, whether the farmer has a cultural education and then hours worked on farm and total hours worked off on and off farm in terms of it's an indicator of work-life balance so again, um, you know, we report across uh, across systems and in, in terms of time trends. So you can see there on the right hand side, for example, we see the dairy farmers uh, amount of time they're spending uh, on and off farm is increasing through time. So then finally, moving on to the environmental leg of the stool, um, we have two 
indicators, two broad indicators in, in under gaseous emissions, greenhouse gas emissions. First, uh, we use IPCC methodology for across all farms, uh, and we use the LCA for dairy, uh, across both ag and energy um, um, uh, sectors or, or categories. For ammonia, we use the national inventory accounting approach replicated by DEPA, so we apply the national method at a farm scale. In terms of risk of water quality, uh, we use a farm input output approach where we're tracking uh, inputs versus outputs and then we generate balances and use efficiencies and for biodiversity we have a framework in development and we're kind of waiting for the publication of the national uh, habitats map to take that work forward so hopefully in years to come we will, we will add a biodiversity indicator to our to our set of a suite of measures in terms of the environmental indicators we publish um 16 uh, in the most recent iteration uh, so it's per, um, agricultural and energy-based GHG emissions for farm per hectare per kilogram of main product, milk, meat, uh, milk, beef, sheep, and so on, and per euro of output. Uh, for ammonia, again, per farm per hectare and per, per kg of output. And and for nitrogen and for for the water quality metrics and balances and use efficiencies, and then P balances and use efficiencies. So again, look at uh, this is just a range of data we publish. This is the you know we slice and dice the data in, in different ways in terms of this is uh, per farm level emission, this is per hectare level emissions, uh, ag based emissions, this is the emissions intensity footprint of, of milk production, and this is uh, emissions per kg per euro of output generated. So let's say you know we would publish across a range you know uh, absolute emissions, emissions intensity, and, and emissions uh, uh, related to revenue. We also, you know, as, as the director said, we're trying to track um, a change in change of farm practice, which is desirable. So, for example, we started to look at things like low emission slurry spreading and protected urea. So, at, a, at both a farm and an aggregate level, we're seeing massive transition towards low emission slurry spreading at farm and aggregate scale. Uh, and these numbers actually will feed into the national inventories and help to reduce it will, it will reduce our ammonia emissions in, in the long run. So, in conclusion. Um, you know, we started around 2008 uh, to look at the um, increasing capacity through the National Farm Survey to develop these uh, sustainability indicators. Um, the data is collected by a team of very professional farm recorders and it's validated by the admin team in, in the National Farm Survey. The economic metrics, we follow the EU FADN conventions in the, in the metrics we report. For the social metrics, we're guided by literature and these are subject to ongoing developments and, and a colleague, uh, Dr. Emma Dillon, um, presented some updates on, 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 on this side last Monday also. Uh, and the environmental metrics, we, you know, we follow national or international conventions. So for example, we use the IPCC guidelines for GHG. We use the national inventory counting processes for, for ammonia and so on. Um, we started the journey in 2013. Um, and that's the last, uh, last Monday was the seventh iteration of the report, as I say. We went from every second year to every year. So we have a, a definitive time series now. Um, and we, we didn't start with 129 indicators. We've been we've been adding these along the way, and we'll, we'll continue to add these into indicators as the data and the science um, allows us to. And it's the results, the time series results, that are really the most interesting. As the director has said, you know, can we track progress through time? So this infrastructure then has been brought to bear on the signpost farms. So the same the same procedures and protocols we collect uh, on, the NF, on general NFS farms, we collect on signpost farms. And they're benefited from our knowledge and, and mistakes and, 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 not, and learnings from since we developed it in, in 2013. So in years to come, when, when multiple years of data becomes available in signpost farms, that's when the progress will be judged. And 2021 is really the base year, the starting point. And it's, uh, you know, the signpost uh, farms are, are at the start of the journey, much like we were back in 2013. So uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, that's um, um, my email address if anyone has a follow-up questions and that link there is where all the previous seven reports can be can be, can be downloaded and looked at. So uh, I'll hand back to you Pat in the studio. Okay, thank you Cahal. Uh, I, could I just remind you uh, to submit your questions using the Q&A facility? Uh, Cahal, we have uh, some questions coming in from the audience and I suppose one, uh, the first question that we have in, it just asks about the comparison between the results on the signpost farms and on the, nas the National Farm Survey, a more representative sample. Sure, Pat. Um, I suppose like the, the farms in the National Farm Survey were given to us by the Central Statistics Office to be representative of farms nationally based on size and system. The signpost farms, uh, you know, were kind of were self-selected in, in, into the program. So they're not 
selected to be representative of, of, of the national population. Uh, um, if I was to put them in terms of com comparability, okay, there are some farms, you know, dairy farms and, and beef and sheep farms that are similar to the average uh, farm. But if you take them as a whole, they're probably at the upper end of the, they're probably at the upper end of the distribution in terms of intensity. Um, you know, so they're probably a slightly they're a bit more intensive than the average farm in, ge in general. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that, Cahill. Uh, Tom O'Dwyer will now present the, the initial findings of the first year's data uh, from the signpost farms. Tom, over to you. Thank you, Pat. Good morning. Uh, the Signpost Programme is a new initiative uh, launched by Chagask in 2021 uh, and the purpose of the Signpost Programme is to lead and support the transition of Irish farming towards more sustainable farming systems. It's a whole of industry approach uh, and we have 62 partners who are part of the Signpost Programme working together with Chagask to help farmers uh, as we move to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from Irish agriculture. There are three parts to the Signpost program. Uh, firstly, a network of demonstration farms, which we call the Signpost Farms. Secondly, a more broad-based Signpost advisory campaign to, to work with and engage all farmers across the country. And thirdly, the National Agricultural Soil Carbon Observatory, which is a research experiment started in uh, 2020 and of which the signpost farmers uh, are all a part. So they're the three elements of the of this overall signpost program. What I'm going to present today largely are, are the results recorded uh, from the signpost farms in 2021. And just towards the end of my presentation, then I will have two slides with some results that are coming through from NASCO. Uh, this chart uh, just shows the uh, signpost farms. We have 119 signpost farms spread right across the country, uh, covering the various different enterprises, including dairy, uh, suckler beef, dairy calf to beef, sheep, tillage, uh, and mixed farming. Uh, this image uh, just shows um, one of our National Farm Survey recorders, Kevin McNamara on the left, and one of our signpost farmers, uh, dairy farmer David Fenley from County Leash. And the reason I, pu I put this image up is because uh, we've worked very closely with the National Farm Survey team in Chagas to record data from the signpost farms through 2021. And I'd like to acknowledge the work of the signpost farmers in recording that data uh, and of the National Farm Survey data recording, recorders for collecting the data and also colleagues uh, Brian and Cahill for data analysis and Siobhan and Owen for uh, generation of the graphics and images that are going to follow. Also, uh, each signpost farmer uh, will receive an individual farm report. Um, about two thirds of our signpost farmers have received this report already in draft format. And before the end of the year, we'll, we'll get out an individual report to each signpost farmer. And it will contain the types of information which I'm going to uh, present over the next number of minutes. Over the next number of slides, I'm, I'm going to look at uh, four enterprises, starting initially with dairy, then beef, then sheep, then tillage. And I'm firstly going to look at a summary overview of uh, the key sustainability metrics that we gathered from the farms last year before looking at in a little bit more depth into four key performance indicators. Uh, that's total greenhouse gases, greenhouse gases emissions per kilo of output, uh, nitrogen use efficiency and the level of uh, protected urea use. Starting with our dairy farms, so um, we have 45 dairy farmers uh, participating as signpost farms. On average last year these farmers generated 988 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent per farm uh, with a carbon footprint of, of 0.93 kilos of carbon dioxide equivalent per kilo of fat and protein corrected milk. And uh, the, the first one is using the IPCC methodology and the second one is using the LCA me methodology. And down towards the bottom of, of the image here behind me, you can see a number of key performance indicators for the, the signpost dairy farms. 28% uh, nitrogen use efficiency, 48% uh, protected urea use, 92% of slurry um, spread using LESS and 80% of slurry spread in the springtime. And you also see uh, on the far left, uh, bottom left of, of this screen, you can see uh, that the profitability figure was just over 2,000 euro per hectare for these 45 dairy farmers on average last year. Moving on to the second uh, image uh, for our, our dairy farms, 
uh, we, can, we, we have four charts uh, behind me now. Uh, you can see that on the, t the I suppose the reason I, I'm putting up these charts is to show the variation in performance uh, for these key performance indicators amongst our 45 dairy farms. Uh, and for example, in terms of total emissions in the top, um, top left here, uh, you can see that there's quite a range in total emissions, uh, but that's reflective of uh, the scale of operation, farm size, the number of dairy cows. In the uh, chart here to my left, you can see the, the carbon footprint figure or the greenhouse gas emissions per kilo of fat and protein corrected milk. Again, you can see a range here. Uh, what, what, it, what is, um, I suppose, giving me confidence on this chart is that we have, we have an, a significant number of our dairy signpost farms are below or have a lower carbon footprint per kilo of fat and protein corrected milk than, do, than does the typical dairy farmer. The typical dairy farmer is represented by the NFS average. So, so I guess this suggests that there's, there's opportunities for more farmers to improve their efficiency of milk production and to reduce their, their greenhouse gas carbon footprint and in turn then allow that to contribute to reducing their total uh, farm greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, on the bottom two charts, and, and, and looking firstly I suppose at the bottom left, uh, you can see uh, nitrogen use efficiency, again a range in performance here. A number of our signpost dairy farmers are below the figure typically uh, recorded on our typical dairy farm. But also there are a number of our signpost dairy farmers that are achieving nitrogen use efficiency figures of above 30%. And that's quite an achievement and I suppose what we have to do is to figure out what's going on on those specific farms and then use that knowledge to help other farmers to improve their nit nitrogen use efficiency performance. And on the bottom right hand you can see that uh, in terms of the protected urea usage we have a range of uh, adoption of that technology on, on our dairy farms. Um, but again, there are farmers that are using significant amounts of protected urea as part of their annual fertilizer program. And again, we have to uh, listen to those farmers and, and look and see what they're doing to figure out how they're making that happen and what difference it's making on their farm. Moving on then to our beef farms, uh, we have 36 signpost beef farms. On average, they generated 429 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent per farm with a greenhouse, uh, 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 sorry, a, a greenhouse gas carbon footprint of 9.2 kilos of carbon dioxide equivalent per kilo of beef live weight. Down at the bottom of this slide, uh, again along the bottom here, uh, you can see a number of the key performance indicators that we've uh, calculated for these farms last year uh, with a nitrogen use efficiency figure of 16%, 18% protected urea usage, 42% uh, of slurry spread using LESS, and 71% of slurry spread in the springtime. And over on the far left, uh, you see a profitability figure reported as well. So again, there's, there, uh, there's a, a, a figure there for profitability. Uh, similar to our dairy farms, we look at this, the, the same four um, key performance indicators in, in more detail. And um, again, similar to our, our dairy farms, you see the range in performance, okay? Um, and that, I suppose, is reflective of uh, the different scale of operation, the different levels of efficiency, uh, the different levels of practice adoption on our signpost beef farms. But again, similar to our dairy signpost farmers, we have uh, already have beef signpost farmers who are achieving high levels of performance in terms of a low carbon footprint per kilo of beef produced, uh, or a high nitrogen use efficiency, or a high level of protected urea usage on their farms. So again, we have to look at those uh, signpost beef farmers that are already achieving the types of performance that we talk about in terms of targets, and we have to use um, their experience and share it with other beef farmers to try and bring about uh, more change. Uh, moving on then to our sheep farms, we have uh, eight signpost sheep farms. On average, they generated 245 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent per farm um, uh, with a, a carbon footprint of 11 kilos of carbon dioxide equivalent uh, per kilo of sheep live weight. And the same key performance indicators are shown uh, along the bottom of this chart uh, as, uh, as were shown previously, in including a profitability figure on the uh, far left. And likewise, uh, for the beef, to, likewise to the beef and the dairy farmers, we have the same 
uh, charts here and these charts demonstrate the range in performance and again similar to the comments I made for signpost beef farmers uh, the range performance uh, re reflects different levels of efficiency, different levels of farm scale, different levels of practice adoption. Um, and we'll be l working with our signpost sheep farmers, as we will with all our signpost farmers, to improve uh, the performance uh, on average of our signpost farmers towards the targets that we have set out to achieve under the program. And the final enterprise I look at is, is our tillage enterprise. Uh, on average here you can see our tillage farms generated the least amount of carbon dioxide per farm at 188 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent per farm. And down along the bottom of this chart you can see that on average the nitrogen usage was 138 kilos of nitrogen per hectare and 35% of uh, uh, tillage ground on these farms uh, for spring crops was sown with a cover crop as well. Uh, and on the far left of, of this chart, similar to uh, the other enterprises, we have a, a profitability figure. Uh, just on this chart, um, we just have, have one additional chart. It's just showing the range in total greenhouse gas emissions per farm for each of the tillage enterprises. And the, the larger tiller, tillage farm has the largest level of overall emissions. We have a bit more work to do with the tillage data, so I'm, I'm not able to, to present any more detail just at this point. So in summary, um, we have uh, established a robust baseline for our signpost uh, farmers for 2021. I've presented a selection of results uh, this morning. During 2022, uh, our National Farm Survey data recorders such as Kevin will be revisiting our signpost farmers such as David and collecting the same uh, data for 2022. So uh, in, in 2023, I'll be able to present uh, results that will compare the 2022 performance with the 2021 performance and we'll begin to see if our advisory efforts in supporting the signpost farmers are beginning to bear dividends in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions from our signpost farms. But I guess that's, that's all in the future. Uh, before I finish, I just want to say a word about some results that are, are beginning to come true from our National Agricultural Soil Carbon Observatory or NASCO research project. Um, already uh, last, last autumn, um, uh, our soil sampling technicians visited uh, 101 of our, soil, of our signpost farms and intensively soil sampled the farms. Uh, 3,000 soil samples in total were, were, were lifted and analysed in the laboratory su subsequently. Also colleagues in Johnstown Castle uh, have erected carbon flux towers on a number of uh, sites across the country, in, in, including a, a number of signpost farms. And it's also planned that um, next year that we'll get back out onto signpost farms and take samples to a deeper depth, up to one metre in depth, from a number of sites on each farm. And all the data then that's gathered through that research project Will be, will be combined to come up with better estimates for the uh, level of soil carbon sequestration in our soils. But the information that has come true to us already are the results of the soil samples that were lifted last autumn and uh, uh, last winter. As I said, 3,000 soil samples uh, in total lifted and analysed from 101 signpost farms. Uh, and starting on the uh, top, top left here, uh, with soil pH uh, 76, uh, 77, or sorry, 56% of our um, soils have uh, optimum soil pH uh, at above si pH 6.2, uh, with 77% of our soils with a, pH, a lime requirement of less than uh, 2.5 tonnes per hectare. On the phosphorus index, we can see that 63% had a phosphorus index of index 3 or 4 and 76% had a phosphorus index of uh, index 3 or 4. When we put all that together, we can see in the chart here in the bottom right that 39% of the soil samples were classed as having optimum soil fertility. That's the correct soil pH and the right levels of phosphorus and potash. That's a good performance, but there is scope for improvement. So there's, there's, there's some work to be done in terms of increasing the percentage of soils that have optimum, soil, uh, optimum fertility for agronomic production. And finally then, in the, in the middle uh, uh, chart on the bottom of this slide, we just see a, a representation of 
the, the soil samples, uh, soil organic carbon results. And two thirds of our soil samples had a soil organic carbon level to 10 centimetres of between 2 and 6%. So that's just an initial uh, sample of results from the, the NASCO uh, research project. And with that, I'll conclude and hand it back to Pat. Thank you, Tom. A lot of work has gone into getting this far, and there's a lot to take in. And I think we're only at the start of a journey in, in relation to the, the data. Again, could I remind you to put your questions for both Tom and Cahill into the, into the Q&A. Uh, Tom, uh, a question fr from the audience. Uh, how important are these results to the, uh, to the Signpost program, including both the aggregate and the individual farm uh, reports? Yeah, I think as we heard uh, our director, Frank O'Mara, saying in the earlier uh, clip, uh, Pat, very important that farmers have measures to, to know where they're starting from and what progress they're making on their journey. So uh, again, as the director said, this is the first time that uh, individual farmers will receive uh, individualized or farm specific reports uh, from the National Farm Survey with, with their own farm sustainability metrics. And our advisors then can work with the farmers to interpret the results and also then to make plans on how they can improve performance uh, over the coming years. That, that methodology has worked for us in Chagas in the past in terms of setting the baseline, sitting down with the farmer to agree an action plan and then tracking progress over time. Okay. Okay, we're now uh, joined by Dr. Cara Gustenberg from, uh, of UCD. Uh, Cara is a member of the Climate Change Council and is also a member of the Signpost Programme Steering Committee. Cara, I believe you're in coming to us from Galway this morning. Yeah, I'm at, thanks. I'm at the National Association of Principals and Deputies annual conference where they're working on the uh, new Leaving Cert module in Climate Action and Sustainable Development. So, good to be here. Oh. Okay, Cara, as a member of the, the Climate Change Advisory Council, you have a particular interest in how Ireland can transition uh, to a low carbon economy. What do these results suggest to you about the ability of farmers to take on board the, the, the changes that are needed to, to reach that goal? Thanks. Pat. I think uh, Cahill said it really well and, and Tom followed with a similar uh, sentiment that, that it's year two when we really start the journey, that's when we'll really start to be able to see changes. But already, I would guess that the audience felt the same way as I did, which is that there's a ton of data already available now from year one that we can be exploring in terms of looking at bringing some of those farmers who were at the below average end in, in some of the KPIs to the above average end to join some of the other farmers who were who were exceeding uh, maybe expectations. So there's a lot of learning already in that data and linking those practices over to the soil fertility data that, that Tom presented there at the end. And, and it's I think it's really exciting that it shows that we can already start to learn lessons from the maybe better performing farms and, and bring them into the less performing farms. So it, it's a great opportunity. My only frustration is that this project wasn't in place when I was doing my PhD in Chagas 15 years ago, because I think uh, the issue was as important then as it is now. And, and, and what a great opportunity to really learn and start to bend that emissions curve in, in agriculture. And um, how important is it, in your opinion, that that uh, we can extend beyond the signpost farms and have this kind of data available to all farmers? Yeah, well, I mean, the, one of the number one questions I get asked uh, when I'm speaking to the public is, what can I do at home to, to do something about climate change? And I always say, well, you have to start by knowing your individual carbon footprint and, and you can't actually improve or get better until you have that baseline data. And the same thing applies to farms as it does to our households. We have to have the baseline data on every farm to be able to tell farmers or to help farmers in, in actually getting that down and addressing the climate uh, issues. So it's absolutely essential that, that we have this information. And I suppose the, the agriculture has a, a sectoral emissions target of, of, a, uh, of 25% uh, by 2030. Uh, what are your thoughts of, of how we translate these sectoral targets into what they mean for, for individual farmers? Yeah, I think we'll see the, the the kind of ability of the signpost program to feed into achieving that national target in year two when we when we start to see what the what the signpost farms are actually doing in terms of emissions reductions. But already 
uh, we can see that there might be some opportunity there that we might start to see some emissions reductions in terms of nitrogen use efficiency and use of protected re urea and, and that there's a lot of potential there. But there's huge urgency. I mean, we, we really need to implement on a wide scale as soon as possible. I don't think we can wait until we have five years of data from signposts before we can start implementing on a larger scale if we're really going to achieve this 25 percent emissions reduction target in the agricultural sector. Okay, uh, some questions coming in from the audience for, for all of our speakers. Uh, a, a quick one, Tom, uh, that uh, might be related or best answered by you. Are there organic farms in the signpost program? Yes, indeed, Pat, there are. Uh, we have 119 farmers uh, signed up as signpost farmers currently, uh, and we're working with those farmers. And included in that number are five organic farmers. Uh, there's two dairy, uh, two beef and one tillage. Um, amongst the organic farmers. There's also a poultry farmer. We have two pig uh, farmers um, and we have a number of our, our own Chagas research demonstration farms and all our agricultural colleges are signed up as uh, signpost farms. And the exact same measurements we had presented earlier um, are being taken on those farms. I just didn't have time to present them all today. Okay. Uh, another question, very interesting to see the quantitative approach being taken. Great to put numbers on this. Uh, what weight are put on each of the dimensions or is, uh, the legs of the stool that you talked about, Carl? Well, um, as I, I kind of say in the, the launch last, last Monday, you know, uh, no one leg of the stool is more important than the other. So, you know, there's no, we don't, we don't weight them. We just say they're, they're equal importance. So if a farm, if a farm is not economically viable, uh, you know, they might they might they might be sustainable in the long term. We we know about the issues about environmental sustainability, how we to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So there's, there is no one number uh, pat to we to we can say you know this person is X amount sustainable. It's really you know in in, the, in those three dimensions you have to think about sustainability. Okay, uh, I suppose a, a technical question is the CO2 uh, calculation done by using GWP 100 or GWP star. And if not, will GWP star start to come into the calculations that, that you're doing? Yeah, we, we're using the GWP 100. So we're basically replicating what's happening at the, at the national inventories level. Um, we could potentially um, transition to GWP star, but we kind of we'll, we'll wait for the, you know, we will we, we'll go in the same direction as the inventories because that's how the that's how our 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 missions are going to be measured. So we we'll kind, of, we'll kind of follow the, 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 science, the science pat on that one. Okay, uh, one for you, Tom. Uh, can you see a consistent picture of higher profitability per hectare with lower emissions? Um, we haven't actually looked at that comparison yet, Pat, but it's, it's a very good question. And it's, it's one of the objectives of the signpost program that we can show a way to uh, agriculture that's both more profitable and, and also produces less greenhouse gas emissions while, while looking after uh, the environment. So it, it, we, we have to do that analysis. Um, I think from the figures I presented, what I can say is that the signpost farmers appear to be at least as profitable, if not more profitable on average than the National Farm Survey, the typical dairy farmer or beef farmer or sheep farmer and, or tillage farmer. So, but we, we will look at that to see if there is a, a relationship between uh, levels of profitability and levels of greenhouse gas emissions. Okay. Uh, Carl, uh, addressing to you, the, the you showed um, reducing greenhouse gas em emissions per um, unit of product, but increasing overall farm uh, emissions at farm, at per, per farm and per hectare level. How consistent is that with, with moving towards our, our greenhouse gas targets? Okay, um, I, as I, went, I kind of went into more detail I said last Monday in terms of the, there's a dairy and non-dairy story. I guess the, the non-dairy systems, their emissions are relatively stable through time, uh, you know, the last six, eight years. But the dairy side, the emissions have been increasing uh, post mid coal abolition. And the... the the three components, you know, on the dairy side, we looked at uh, carbon footprint, which has been declining, which is efficiency gain. The uh, output per cow has actually been increasing, which is efficiency gain. But those efficiency gains have been overridden by increasing herd size. I think their average herd size has gone from 70 to 90 cows. So, you know, we have to, uh, you know, the footprint is obviously good, it's declining. But we also have to look at absolute emissions. So, you know, we have to, if we're, if we're to meet this 25% this targets, we have to get the absolute emissions down. So like all the measures that are in the MAC curve and stuff that's in, in development will have to be brought to bear 
on our farms, particularly on the methane side, to get those to get us anywhere close to the to three five to get us to uh, three five percent. So we really have to, you know, uh, all all technologies in development and existing technologies have to be adopted for us to, to, to get, get where we need to go. Yeah, you 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 mentioned the recent sustainability report, uh, and there's a number of, of of trends in it. What trends are there coming from that sustainability report that I suppose give you optimism that we're we're moving in the right direction? And, and maybe what trends are are concerning? Well, I guess you know the on the dairy side, um, uh, highly it's the economic powerhouse, highly profitable, a lot more so than the other systems. But also, you know, I, and I raised it last Monday of concern about the number of hours the dairy farms, dairy farmers are working. You know, it's a question mark whether the amount of hours they're working are sustainable in the long run because it's trending upwards towards three thousand hours a year, like which is which is a crazy amount of hours. Um, on the emission side, uh, there's positive stories when it comes to ammonia. You know, the uh, adoption of things like low emission slurry spreading and protected urea are seeing us uh, our ammonia emissions declining. Our GHG emissions is a tricky one because it's um, you know again it's a dairy it's a dairy versus non dairy side the non dairy side are relatively stable the dairy side their emissions are trending upwards on the back of uh, increased herd sizes and it would be, actually be larger the emissions would be larger if we hadn't achieved efficiency gains in terms of the footprint and the output per cow so we really kind of need to I suppose we need to get 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 everything we can adopted on dairy farms to get that get that curve trending downwards in the future. I, I suppose on that one, Pat, you know, if, if you look at the, the signpost farmers, dairy farmers as a group, you know, they've adopted the mitigation actions such as uh, the usage of protected urea, increased usage of low emission slurry spreading and the application of slurry in the springtime were the, were the three mitigation actions I, I presented. Um, and I suppose I'd, I'd just ask Cahill to comment, you know, if, if the typical dairy farmer as represented in your sample were to be achieving the same level of adoption of those mitigation actions, would it would it make a big difference? Do you think to the to the national picture, or how big a difference would it make to the national picture? Oh, it would certainly make a difference. You know, um, you know, and we, you know, it really. But we, at the same time, you know, if, if we had a stable herd, you know, and we we adopt these practices, it would definitely uh, shift the curve downwards. But I suppose, like we, it, it is, you know, what what we're seeing in the data is that the herd sizes are, are tends to, to, to tend to override the efficiency gains. So you know, it's just a case of, of trying to. Um, get to a point like where where farmers where farmers are, are happy with the with their herd size, but also in terms of their 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 work life balance. I keep going back to the hours worked. You know, if you're they're adding more and more animals, but they're actually working a lot more hours as well. Like you know, so that question mark is that in my in my mind is whether the the, the system is sustainable from a work life balance perspective, if not from an environmental perspective. Mm. So look, I think that there are definitely opportunities on the average farm compared to signposts. They're, they're not at the the frontier in terms. Significant look to improve in terms of okay, they, they move towards less, but protected urea is the levels of, are, are, are are improving, but from a very low base, like seven percent. So if we could add up, like you know, would make big, a big difference uh, in, in 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 the emissions profile. Mm. Okay, and, and I suppose just uh, uh, moving, you you mentioned a couple of issues around soil fertility and and the use of of uh, protected urea, and we have a good few questions coming in in the in the area of of uh, uh, soil fertility. Uh, and it's emphasised. But how does soil fertility have a significant bearing in terms of our objectives to, to uh, reach our, our greenhouse gas emissions targets? Yeah, that, that's a very good question, uh, Pat. Um, um, you know, and I suppose sometimes we, 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 we perhaps um, we, 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 miss, we, we fail to make the connection between that improving soil fertility message and uh, reducing emissions message. So that's, it's, it's a very relevant question. I suppose how, how it helps is that as farmers improve soil fertility, so they correct soil pH deficiencies, uh, improve soil P and K levels to optimum index three, um, th th those activities then will allow the soil to release more nitrogen, uh, which is in the soil naturally. And the farmer then can consequently can uh, dial back the fertilizer spreader, can reduce the amount of chemical uh, fertilizer uh, add, added, added to the crop. Um, also, through the use of low emission slurry spreading and the application of slurry in the springtime, you get better uh, value from your slurry, more of the nitrogen is returned to the crop, and the consequence of that should be for the farmer, uh, should be that you're able to uh, reduce your fertilizer input. Now, I, I think there's evidence from across the signpost farms this year in particular with the, both with the emphasis on improving soil fertility, but also with the high price of fertilizer as an input, 
uh, farmers are, are taking more notice of better soil fertility and of uh, the usage of animal slurries and they're tailoring their, their fertilizer programs accordingly. Okay, thanks, thanks for that. And I, I have, I suppose, what's more a, a, a comment uh, than a, a question from, from uh, one of our colleagues who, uh, it, uh, who talks about the, the indication that in index four is, uh, particularly for P, is, is part of our optimal from a, a soil fertility and a, a growth perspective, but just making the point that we need to make sure to balance our our uh, applications to try and keep it down at, at, at index three. So ab I think ab ab absolutely, there's an opportunity for savings. Uh, and again, it goes back to that earlier question about the linkage between looking after the environment uh, and um, improving the profitability or reducing the costs of, of uh, food production. So that's a clear example of, of, a, of a situation where the farmer has an opportunity to reduce their fertilizer inputs, uh, in, in that case, uh, phosphorus. Uh, while and, and sa save costs and uh, look after the environment. Okay, uh, a question as to how does the overall program and, and the information that we're providing link with the work that's been done uh, by Board BIA in terms of their sustainability report? Uh, yeah, another good question. Um, I, we're, we're both trying to achieve the same thing um, we, we, uh, and Board BIA are partners in the signpost program. So we work very closely with Board BIA is, is the first point. Um, the second point, uh, the, the big linkage I would see currently is that uh, I have presented results uh, earlier uh, mm. for the um, sustainability metrics for the signpost farms. Cahill has presented results uh, earlier this week for the, the typic, typ a typical farm, a farm across the country. Um, and for any farmer then, and I believe there's between 54 five and 56,000 farmers are members of the Board B Equality Assurance Schemes. All 18,000 dairy farmers are members and, and there's a, a, a sizable number of beef farmers are members as well. And those farmers then, as a result of completing the sustainability audit that's part of that um, every uh, 18 months audit, um, they, they receive a farmer feedback report. And on that farmer feedback report, there are a number of um, key performance indicators provided uh, and they are very similar to the ones that I presented earlier. So if you're a farmer listening, I guess you can have a look at your farmer feedback report from Board BIA uh, and you can see what your carbon footprint is, you can see uh, what your nitrogen use efficiency figure is and you should be able to compare that with the performance of your local signpost farmer and you can then start to see whether you're ahead of or, or, or the same as or, or behind the performance of a, a signpost farmer and, and use that as a guide or a benchmark. Okay. Cara, I suppose one that you might uh, begin with, uh, why are we talking about reducing uh, the, the beef herd uh, and reducing emissions from, from the beef sector if greenhouse gases are stable in this sector versus the dairy farms where greenhouse gases are, are rising? Yeah, I, I don't think anyone has come right out and said it's necessarily beef over dairy. I think it's total emissions that we have to reduce. And we have a 25 percent target across the agricultural sector. And we still don't yet have a plan on how that 25 percent will be allocated. But we were talking about, you know, an, essentially an average. It, it may be 25 percent in some farms, maybe more in others and maybe less in others. Uh, but but that plan has not been presented. And what we need very badly is leadership from the sector, uh, you know, within government and within stakeholder groups to put forward a plan that does work, that, that actually makes sense for all the different types of agriculture we have, and also keeps in mind that, that we have biodiversity issues. And one of the advantages of, of some of our beef farming is that it's low intensity and it is actually maybe more advantageous for biodiversity. And we are in the middle of a biodiversity crisis in addition to a climate crisis. So we have to keep that uh, at the front of our mind, in addition to the water quality issues that we're facing too. So I definitely don't think it's, it's necessarily beef versus dairy because of all the environmental issues that we're facing. Okay, and, and I think to follow on from that, uh, th there has been a lot of focus on, on dairy herd size and I suppose you're looking at the, uh, the, the, the ability of, of farms through looking at the MAC to try and reduce our, our emissions. How confident are you that we can reach the 25% without necessarily cutting the, the national herd? 
Yeah, I think Carl really explained it well when he said we have to implement essentially everything on that Mac curve in a majority of Irish farms uh, to get even close to achieving that 25% target, which means we still have some shortfall there that we're not going to meet just by implementing everything in the Mac curve. And I think we know enough about behavioral change to know that even having the expectation that we're going to do everything on that Mac curve across most farms in Ireland is probably unrealistic. So we are going to have to step back and look at our food production system more generally and figure out where we're going to get that extra 5% or whatever it is um, to achieve the targets. And, and, and we need to have a, a conversation with everybody on, on how we approach that. So I don't think anyone is all that confident of meeting the 25% uh, target based on business as usual. I, I think the, the MAC analysis is showing that that's probably not a realistic assessment. And, and Pat, can I come in there? I, I, I think the important thing for listeners is to be very clear that we, we need to take action now. We need to um, all work together to support farmers take on the mitigation actions that are clearly identified so, so that an increasing number of farmers are reporting that they're using protected urea, that they've reduced fertilizer nitrogen usage, um, that they're using more clover, that they're using low emission slurry spreading. All these technologies are, are there to be used by farmers and once they're used by farmers we will see a, 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 a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and we, you know, in the future more technologies will come forward and we can talk then in the future about what those technologies are and what the potential of those technologies are. But, but for now we, we, we urgently need to make a start so I'd, I'd absolutely support Cara in that. Okay. Uh, just a, a, there was a question there as to the, the availability of the, 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 the draft report and, and uh, it's available on the, the signpost page if you, if you check the, the Chagask uh, signpost page. Uh, Cahal, a question for you. Are there plans to collect more data on the uh, NFS in relation to the signpost farms and I suppose in, in, in general terms uh, and, uh, in, th in the near future? Yeah, we're, we're, I suppose, Pat, we're constantly looking to see where we can collect more uh, more activity data to, to answer questions. Like, for example, um, soil fertility is a, is a bit of a gap we have in the National Farm Survey in terms of our, our general farms. So we've been looking at maybe trying to link, link in with things like NMP online and pasture based to, to, to leverage data that's in those databases. So it's kind of a work in progress. On the biodiversity one, uh, again, like we have... We've been working with John Finn and other ecologists uh, in, in, in Chagas to come up with a kind of a way of, of estimating or kind of a, a matrix or an index of estimating biodiversity. So we think we have a working framework. Uh, what we're waiting for is kind of a national habitats map to be published. So, you know, as, as I said, when we started in 20, 2013, we probably had, had, had half the amount of indicators we have now. So we're constantly trying to add to that suite of measures based on activity data we can, we can get through the National Farm Survey. Hmm. Tom, in, in uh, relation to, uh, I suppose, spreading the message from mm. signpost farms right out to the whole farming community, mm. uh, advisors are going to be a key part of it, both Chagas and, and uh, uh, private advisors. Mm. I suppose, what do you, would you like to see them take on board in terms of working with their, their clients to try and get the, the messages out there and to try and get farmers to take on board the actions that we're trying to, to achieve? Yeah, um, I suppose for, firstly, uh, each of the signpost farmers, and there's 120 of them across the country, spread right across the country, uh, will we'll get an individual report. So, there you know, and, and the, the person who knows that farmer best is their local advisor. So in the first instance, I'd hope that local advisors would engage deeply with, local, you know, their signpost farmers in their locality, perhaps organise for groups of advisors to go out onto that farm and to, you know, to see what's going on and explore the data. So that's one. Number two then, I suppose, to engage with any training that's offered, and we will be offering training. Um, there, you know, the reports uh, that Carl presented uh, earlier this week and that I present this morning um, contain new, new, new performance indicators and new metrics. And it takes time to become familiar with, with those measures and to understand maybe why a measure is high or low on a farm. You know, what's, what's, what's driving that change in that, in that performance figure? So I suppose that the second thing then is that you know there's, there's a responsibility in all advisors to familiarise yourself with the, these new performance indicators and new metrics. You know, our dairy advisors are very familiar with EBI and milk solids per cow or per hectare and tons of grass dry matter grown. But there was a time when 
dairy advisors were not familiar with those metrics. But by engaging with the figures, by talk, you know, talking with colleagues about them, by engaging with farmers, by using the figures then at farm walks and events, the f familiarity and um, gr grew with the figures. And, and I, I wouldn't see it any different w in terms okay. of coming to grips with greenhouse, total greenhouse gas emissions, total ammonia emissions, greenhouse gas per hectare or, or so on. And finally, how are farmers reacting to the reports that they're getting? I, I think um, s similar to advisors, there's a number of new metrics being presented to farmers for the, ver for the first time. So they're, they're, they're asking questions. Um, and I have heard some reports that some farmers, when they've looked at the reports, they've, they've questioned some of the figures and, and they're, they've, they've queried as to why a figure is, is as it is. So that's good. That's good. We can expect a lot of questions in this initial phase. Um, and then as, as people become familiar with how the figures are calculated and the, the, the relevance of the figures to their farm, um, they'll become more comfortable and they'll be able to start making decisions and, and start making future plans based on the information that's available to them. Okay, thank you, Tom. And I'd like to thank our, our contributors, uh, Cara, Cahal. Um, I would also like to thank our, our production team of uh, Declan McArdle and Rachel Grehan. Uh, and to the series producers Andy Boland and Yvonne Maher. Uh, next week we'll be joined by Dr Mary Ryan who will be telling us about the Watermark project which aims to mitigate the impacts of agriculture on water through research and, and knowledge transfer. With that I leave you till and, and wish you well till next week. Thanks and goodbye. You've been listening to the podcast version of the Chagisk Signpost series the weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. Don't forget to join us live every Friday morning for our latest webinar. For more, visit chagisk.ie. And you can also rate, review and subscribe to the Signpost series on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. I'm Mark Gibson and thanks for listening.